All right, fellows, today let's take a look at the Socialist Republic of Romania or the Romanian People's Republic, which was overthrown about 30 years ago in a military coup. The industrialization and socialist policies which took place in the nation transformed the lives of its citizens, so why did rationing and shortages take place in the later years? Despite hopes that the introduction of capitalism would bring the commonly promised wealth and prosperity, many would say that life in the nation today is worse than even the most difficult years under socialism in the 80s. Polls today show that the majority of Romanians prefer socialism. So why is this? First, let's cover some basic history. When the communists first came to power, the wealthy nobility and the bourgeoisie were stripped of their property. Land and major industries were collectivized and a centrally planned economy was introduced. Modern housing was built on a mass scale and the right to a job was introduced. Beginning as a mostly agrarian nation, Romania was able to make great leaps in industrializing and modernizing. The US Federal Research Division writes the following about Romania prior to World War II. Before World War II, Romania was overwhelmingly agrarian. In the late 1940s, roughly 75% of the population was engaged in agriculture. It was a poor and backward peasant agriculture. Inferior yields were eked from plots of land that grew ever smaller as the rural population increased. Although a fair amount of industrial activity was nurtured by state contracts and foreign investments, industrial development was slow and failed to create alternative employment opportunities for the overpopulated and impoverished countryside. The bourgeoisie was weakly developed. Atop the low social pyramid stood a disproportionately powerful social elite, a remnant of the nobility that once owned most of the land in the Old Kingdom. The initial transformation into a socialist system began with the Soviet victory in World War II. During World War II, Romania was run by a fascist dictatorship that maintained extremely close ties with Nazi Germany. Hundreds of thousands were sent to their deaths in concentration camps and the Romanian military was a key part of the Axis fight on the Eastern Front. As the war continued, resistance to this dictatorship grew and in August of 1944, a coalition led by the Communist Party arrested the dictator. Following this, the advance of the Red Army was able to increase in speed and they now fought alongside the Romanian army who had switched sides. After years of fascism, there was no democratic pre-war government to return to, and the remaining parties and monarchy had been discredited in their assistance of the fascist takeover. In 1946, elections were held with the highest number of participants in the nation's history. The National Democratic Front, which was a coalition led by the Romanian Communist Party, came out on top. A few years later, the Communist Party would merge with the Social Democratic Party and form the Romanian Workers' Party. The task of rebuilding the nation was going to be a difficult one. Essentially, half of industry was destroyed during the war, and the population went from 20 million to 15 million. The life expectancy was 40 years, and most of the people left were rural peasants. But the newly formed state quickly got to work to develop the nation and took many steps to eliminate the aristocratic class which had long exploited the population. The US Federal Research Division writes, A few measures in the early days of the communist rule easily eradicated the upper crust from the Ancien Regime. Land reforms in 1945 eliminated all large properties and thus deprived the aristocracy of their economic base and their final vestiges of power. The currency reform of 1947, which essentially confiscated all money for the state, was particularly ruinous for members of the commercial and industrial bourgeoisie who had not fled with their fortunes. In addition, the state gradually expropriated commercial and industrial properties so that by 1950, 90% of all industrial output was directly controlled by the state, and by 1953, only 14% of the shops remained privately owned. Romania showed great promise in the start. The first new head of state was Gheorghe Gorghiu Desh, whose name I am not confident in pronouncing. He pursued an independent economic and foreign policy. During his period, he opposed Khrushchev and his de-Stalinization policy, raised the standards of living and helped lead one of the most successful agrarian reforms in the Eastern Bloc. In 1947, Romania was a very rural, poor, and backwards country one of, if not the least developed area of Europe. For the next 30 years, however, Romania had one of the highest economic growth rates in the world, with an almost third of its people moving to urban centers to work in the newly built industrial plants. Between 1950 and 1971, the number of hospital beds per 1,000 people doubled. The number of doctors per 1,000 people went up 25%. 
infant mortality was reduced by 75%, and at the end of the Second World War, only a bit more than a quarter of the population was literate. Within 20 years, however, illiteracy in the nation was non-existent. Within 25 years, the number of teachers tripled and the number of professors went up by 600%. Farmland was collectivized, and life expectancy was able to rise by 30 years. Industrial output rose by 650%. Almost 5 million homes were built. The US Federal Research Division writes the following about social mobility within socialist Romania. The economic development following the imposition of communist rule created considerable upward mobility. The rapid development of free education created a demand for teachers, and in 1969, more than 83% of the working population were the product of this mass social mobility, and held positions of greater status than had their fathers. More than 43% of those in upper-level positions had working-class origins, and 25% had peasant backgrounds. But Romania was ultimately still a developing nation behind the West and even behind its fellow communist bloc countries. Lessening ties with the Soviets was considered to be a possible solution to get past this gap. One of the main reasons for this were the reparations placed on Romania, among other nations, to help pay for part of the immense damage suffered by the Soviet Union during the Second World War, which proved to be an ankle weight on the already not very strong economy of Romania. Around the 50s, Romania began to establish economic relationships with Western capitalist nations to further distance themselves from the Soviets. Around this same time, in the late 50s, Romania negotiated the removal of Soviet troops from the nation, being the only Eastern Bloc nation to do so. Fast forwarding to the 1970s, it was a period of very impressive growth for the nation through trade with the West and the introduction of foreign credit. However, this increasing relationship with the West came hand in hand with increasingly reactionary positions. Romania recognized the FRG over the GDR and established ties with Israel. Romania would increase its reliance on Western loans at high interest rates from organizations like the IMF and the World Bank. When these loans were first taken, the IMF was viewed as a much more neutral entity compared to its reputation today. And because Romania had taken a relatively middle ground position in the Cold War, they figured that they were safe from any aggressive moves from the UN-backed entity, but certain clauses of the loans led to an exponentially increasing debt. These debts came back to bite them following the energy crisis of the late 70s and the global financial crisis of the early 80s, which led to a steep increase in oil prices which led to a steep drop in Romania's revenue from exports alongside a severe earthquake which heavily damaged industrial facilities. Romania became trapped in this extreme debt that threatened the survival of the nation, which it could not pay off. Beginning in the early 80s, Romania began to ration power and food, with as much products as possible being exported to pay down the loans. People suffered the winter cold with their heat being shut off, and non-basic foods like meat and milk were hard to find. People were essentially living with the bare minimum. Around the same time, the Soviet Union began to undertake capitalist reforms and attempt to create positive relationships with the West. One of the effects of this was the steep decline in trade with its fellow socialist nations, which deeply damaged their economies as well as pushing their fellow socialist nations to undergo liberal reforms. This further damaged the economy of Romania. By early 1989, Romania had freed itself from its debt and created laws against taking any further foreign loans, yet despite this, the rationing continued and so did the growing discontent within the population. Protests arose throughout the nation and in late December, Ceausescu, whose name I am also not confident in pronouncing, spoke in front of protesters in a rally in Bucharest. He made many announcements, including salary and pension increases, hoping to subdue the grievances of the people. But this had little effect, and following the sound of gunshots, riots broke out. Protesters remained in the street due to a combination of very legitimate issues that had been building up and further agitation by propaganda outlets like Radio Free Europe and the media which had been seized by the military. Blatantly false events were reported like a massacre of 80,000 protesters occurring in the Romanian city of Timișoara. This was reported widely throughout the nation and the world. It was later revealed that the pictures of mass graves were actually unclaimed corpses from a pauper's grave, many showing advanced decomposition. The death toll went from 80,000 to a later confirmed 71. Meanwhile, the military defected against the government, sparking violence. 
six months prior to the coup, the so-called Council of National Salvation was formed by military generals. Ceausescu and his wife were forced to flee in a helicopter, but were abandoned by their pilot on a country road, and were captured soon after. As previously mentioned, the military-led NSF seized control of the media and declared themselves to be the new government. The widely portrayed story of a spontaneous popular uprising began to fall apart, with one general who had led the coup admitting that it had been planned long before. A secret military tribunal charged Ceausescu and his wife with crimes which were later openly revealed as fabricated and they were both executed soon after. The following days saw the entire leadership of the Communist Party imprisoned, with some communists even being lynched in the streets. The NSF did not take long in outlawing the Communist Party. U.S. Embassy cables stated that the events has made it possible to pursue in numerous heretofore unthinkable ways our fundamental policy goals in Romania. Recent investigations have also led prosecutors to say that the protests themselves were orchestrated by the Romanian military. The case was reopened in November 2016 for the fourth time, and according to the investigation team, the inquiry determined that there was a deliberate disinformation campaign using state television and radio in 1989 in order to create a state of panic. It was also stated that the prosecutors have identified the source of the blasting noises that caused panic at the rally and led to protest against Ceausescu. It was stated that the Romanian military in 1987 acquired equipment that imitated the sound of shooting and of airborne troops landing by parachute. To be clear, it was not a people's revolution. It was a coup by a powerful elite, and of about 1,100 people killed during the process, more than 900 people died after the National Salvation Front had taken the reins of power. Documents released for the criminal investigation have also supported the idea that it was anything but a popular revolution, including the statements of over 12,000 witnesses. In one such statement, a military commander stated that he had received orders to destroy the Bucharest Central University Library in order to create the image of heavy fighting. U.S. legal experts advised Romanian politicians in the creation of new laws and its new constitution. Romania was quickly turned into another neo-colony for the U.S. New laws allowed 100% foreign ownership of investments, state-owned enterprises were sold for dirt-cheap prices, and the generous social services were stripped. By the mid-90s, half of the Romanian people lived on less than $160 a month, made even worse by the removal of price controls and subsidies on food. Unemployment, which previously did not exist, ravaged millions, and inflation reached 300%. The new government relied on the support of the right wing and subsequently fueled it. This led to massive increases in violence against ethnic minorities throughout the nation. One New York Times article writes, The millions of gypsies of Eastern Europe have emerged as great losers from the overthrow of communism. Many of the economic and social protections that gypsies enjoyed in Hungary, Romania, and Czechoslovakia collapsed, permitting a revival of the open prejudice and persecution that have marked the history of the Roma, as gypsies prefer to call themselves. While the years of austerity and rationing were undeniably difficult, that doesn't mean that life today is much better. Many would argue that it's worse. Ten years after the 1989 fall of socialism in the nation, the average wage slipped to $80 a month, and one-third of the population lived on less than $2 a day. It's gotten so bad that Romania has the highest levels of emigration in Europe, with over 3.5 million people leaving the nation since the fall of socialism. The population of Romania has actually decreased by 12% since 2002. It remains one of the poorest nations in the EU, and 85% of jobs pay less than the minimum needed to survive. 70% of the country's rural population are living below the poverty line, according to the World Bank. The healthcare system in Romania has also been on the verge of collapse due to large debt, oftentimes running out of basic medicines and supplies. Romania's score on the UN Human Development Index, measured on a scale of 0 to 1, has also significantly decreased since the restoration of capitalism, from 0.863 in 1990 to 0.717 in 2017. All this is also reflected in public sentiment, with one poll of Romanians showing that 63% of the survey participants said that their life was better during communism. In 2010 and 2011, the Center for the Study of Market and Opinion conducted three opinion polls with regard to the Romanian public perception of communism. 
According to these surveys, about 60% of the Romanian population believes that communism was a good idea, while only a quarter considered to be a bad idea. The results are even more pro-socialism if we look at the older generations who would have experienced it longer and into their adult lives. 74% of those older than 60 considered communism to be a good idea. One 68-year-old retiree states, I regret the demise of communism, not for me, but when I see how much my children and my grandchildren struggle. We had safe jobs and decent salaries under communism. We had enough to eat and we had yearly vacations with our children. One 60-year-old stated, Now young people have no idea what will happen with them after they finish school. We have never had such problems. We had a future perspective. We knew from the first year what we would do. Another stated when asked if he would go back, Yes, I had a secure job, some benefits, a gas cylinder, and a house, which is the most important thing a person can have. People were so free that you could walk in the street without worrying that anyone would beat you up or take your girl away. When he was asked about the austerity period, he responded, You are too young. You only know stories. When a family wants to buy a new fridge or a stove, they tighten the belt a little. And so, Ceausescu tightened things a little in order to make a road. A 2010 poll conducted by the Romanian Institute for Evaluation and Strategy provided similar results. 54% claimed that they had better living standards during communism, while only 16% said that they were worse. Also, 49% stated that Ceausescu was a good leader, while only 15% said he was bad. One Washington Times article states, a tanking economy has left many Romanians longing for a return to communism because they think that the democratic and free market reforms of the past two decades have failed. They view communism as a system that guaranteed stability and safety. In the four decades prior to the 1989 revolution that toppled Ceausescu, the communist regime guaranteed citizens a job and a home. Once capitalism was ushered in at the end of 1989, the industrial mammoth of Ceausescu's era collapsed quickly leaving more than 1 million people jobless. Romania's best years and achievements did not occur under the domination of capitalism and imperialism. They occurred through planning on the basis of human needs and breaking the restrictions of a profit-based system. So we've reached the conclusion of the video. If you've enjoyed, go ahead and like, subscribe, follow on Instagram and Twitter, uh, join the newly established Discord, Drop any suggestions for videos in the community tab, and I'll see you guys next time.